Chapter 6, Infection Prevention and Control. Chapter Objectives. Clinical Objectives. Normal flora or micro is microorganisms that exist in the body and on our skin, they provide natural immunity against some infections. These normal flora prevent harmful <clears throat> organisms from colonizing in the body. And it is vital that a nurse understands how the body defends itself against infection and how to prevent um, further exposure to disease producing microorganisms. So as a nurse, I understand that an infection is the presence as well as growth of pathogenic microorganisms. And it happens in a susceptible host. So you um, need to know that infections can be communicable means that they're passed from one person through touch or indirectly by um, use of a contaminated object, or they are non-communicable, means that they're not passed. So a disease process can be a possibility of the outcome of an infection. Once the infection has occurred, we know that the patient is considered communicable, meaning that they can expose someone else or share. Um, the period of when the patient is infectious can vary depending on the type of situation and the type of illness. Uh, once the organism has gotten into the host and it is well nourished, it'll start multiplying. When the organisms have found a place where they can multiply, they can spread throughout the body through the circulatory or the lymphatic system. So things that help influence um, infection as well as disease is we look at the type of exposure. So what is the person's lifestyle? Okay, do they smoke? Do they drink? Or do they have... Um, are they very have promiscuous sexual activities you know their occupation what's their chances of being exposed to something there where do they live do they live near the dump do they live in downtown where it's got a lot of smog do they live out in the country you know where maybe there's a farm and pesticides have been spread and then we also look at the host so the the host would be the individual that might have the infection. You look at their immunologic system. So do they have their immunizations? We're concerned with nutritional status because we know we need a certain amount of proteins to help repair and build strong tissues. And then we just consider the overall environment factors. These are factors that make the individual susceptible for getting potentially getting an infection or a disease process. Okay, so any microorganism that can cause a disease is known as a pathogen. Once these disease-causing microorganisms have entered the body, Oftentimes, they're able to adapt to the new environment. That will increase their chances of survival and increase their chances of causing someone to become ill. So these can be passed or transferred between person to person through one of three different routes. It can be airborne, contact, or droplet. As nurses, we know that hand hygiene is the best way to, to prevent the spread of any type of organism.
Bacteria are classified into three main categories according to their shape, the way they take stain and a gram stain, and their requirements for oxygen. So bacteria can either be round, rod-shaped, or spiral or corkscrewed. Things that require oxygen are aerobic and things that cannot grow in the presence of oxygen are considered as anaerobic. A virus is not a cell. A virus injects itself into the cells of the host so that it can reproduce. So viruses either interrupt the DNA or the RNA within the cells. Protozoa, those are one-celled organisms that have movement ability and they are named by the way they travel in their environment. Routinely, protozoa are found in water and or soil. So your fungus, these are very small, but yet primitive organisms. These grow on living plants, animals, and decaying organic matter. They like to live in a warm, moist environment. So if you think about moss growing on a tree, okay, um, that'll help you picture what a fungus is. Once someone gets a fungal infection, it can be difficult to eradicate because fung um, fungi usually form spores. And we know that spores are resistant to routine antimicrobial products. So helmets are worms. These can either be flat, round, or hook-like. These are all parasites, and routinely they are spread through the fecal-oral route. In children, we can um, oftentimes find pinworms from children playing in sandboxes, putting their hands in their mouths. <clears throat> and Pinworms will actually come out around the perianal area and you will notice a child is scratching and that's because they lay the eggs, the pinworms lay their eggs outside of the rectum. So our body has its own defensive mechanisms against infection. Our skin is our first line of infection as well as our intact mucous membranes, which would be like your gums, your intestinal tract, <clears throat> we have normal flora that lives inside and on our body. Our body has the inflammatory response, which is routinely what happens right after an injury occurs. And then we have the immune response to help ward off getting any specific communicable diseases. Your skin is your first barrier, first line of protection against an infection. It needs to be intact. On our skin resides um, normal flora. These are standard on every, but on every individual. When we're talking about chemical barriers, we know that our tears, our saliva, and our sweat they are all chemical barriers. So your mute, mucous membranes of the respiratory, the gastrointestinal or GI tract, and the reproductive tracts, they have their own bacterial enzymes. This same enzyme is found in tears and saliva. That's what makes tears and saliva a chemical barrier. So the body has two forms of immunity. It can either be innate, which is something that we're born with or naturally acquired. Oftentimes um, that's part of the baby getting defense, defensive mechanisms from the mother whenever they're in utero. Or it can be acquired and that, that's something that we gain throughout our life. So when we're talking about the defensive mechanisms, we're thinking about our patient's state of health. They're thinking about their nutrition. We're considering their 
hormone balance, their immune status, um, and the presence of any chronic disease processes. So if you think about diabetes, right, this would influence the degree of susceptibility that a person would have to get an infection. Fever is one of the primary methods the body uses to prevent an infection from some invading pathogen or microorganism. Once the immune system has determined that, they, <clears throat> that an invader is trying to get in, it will actually signal the hypothalamus in the brain to raise the body temperature. This will help fight off the infection. As nurses, we know that we need adequate protein so that the individual can fight an infection. If the body doesn't have enough protein stored, it will not have enough protein to generate and make antibodies to help fight off an infection. We know that very young individuals as well as older adults have less efficient immune systems. So this is why it is vital for us to make sure that these specific individuals receive vaccinations and immunizations. So an antigen is a form of a protein that's found on the outside of the cells. What this protein or the, what this antigen does is it allows the body to identify this cell as either something that belongs or something that doesn't. So antigens can actually stimulate the immune response to wipe out microorganisms. Antibodies, these are also known as immunoglobulins. These are part of our acquired immunity. These have various functions depending on which immunoglobulin is being discussed. They can neutralize toxins or kill the invading pathogen. Bone marrow is a major component of the defense system. It plays an important role because it manufactures the blood products that the body needs to help defend itself. These blood products would be leukocytes, which include neutrophils, macrophages, and lymphocytes. So leukocytes are white blood cells. Leukocytosis is a term that means an increased number of leukocytes or white blood cells. Routinely, this is seen at the beginning stage of an infection. This is when the individual's immune system has not yet been overly stressed. Leukocytosis is often seen more with a bacterial infection than with a viral infection. Phagocytosis, this is when we have a cell that comes in and will gobble up the um, antigens. This is a form of innate immunity. And this is one of the body's first line defenses at the cellular level. A macrophage is a large white cell or a large leukocyte that have actually left the bloodstream and migrated into the tissues. These will ingest or, and destroy pathogens and also get rid of like cellular debris and dead neutrophils. So when we're talking about the liver cells, this is where 50% of all the macrophage cells can be found. These liver cells are called comfort cells. These macrophages um, can either act to prevent invasion or to neutralize the pathogen chemically through the pH of the blood and body secretions. So normal flora are normally present on the skin and in the mucous membranes, gastrointestinal tract, and vaginal area. These coexist in the body and help control the growth of harmful pathogens. Um, Candida albicans routinely is what causes a yeast infection. In the mouth, this will be known as thrush. And this will happen after treatment with antibiotics. This is because the normal flora 
has actually been destroyed. This is what allows the candida to grow and flourish. C. diff or C. difficile, this is prevalent in the environment and part of the normal flora of the bowel. This becomes active when a patient has, again, been had too many antibiotics, then it allows the C. diff to grow uncontrolled. So inflammation, this happens immediately. It is localized and it is a protective response of our bodies to any type of injury or damage that happens to our cells or our tissues. This is actually considered the second line of defense and it is at the cellular, cellular level. The inflammatory changes that are listed, these are actual part of the inflammatory process that occur locally. They can also occur at the site of injury and they could occur systemically throughout the whole body. If we don't have an adequate in, inflammatory response, this may actually cause a systemic infection. So as a nurse, it's vital that we understand the signs and symptoms of inflammation. So locally, in one area, you're going to see redness, feel warmth, you're going to see edema, and the patient may tell you that it's painful. If it is systemic or throughout the body, your patient may complain of a headache, they may have myalgia, they may ha have a fever, they may have diaphoresis, which is sweating, they may be chilled, not want to eat, become anorexic, and have a general feeling of malaise or just tired. When we talk about chemical releases and vascular changes, this is when we think about interferon and serotonin. This occurs in this occurs with localized swelling or edema. An immune response is a series of complex chemical and mechanical changes. So the immune response is thought, I mean, is determined that it it detects the entry of a foreign body or a foreign pathogen as soon as they enter into the body. There is an immediate reaction with the immune response as something as being foreign to our system. And it, immune response has the ability to distinguish one kind of foreign invader from another. And it can remember that particular agent, even if it happens multiple years later. Uh, the third line of defense for our bodies is the immune response. This attempts to defend and protect the body through a series of chemical and mechanical activities. We think about hormones like cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid that is produced in the adrenal cortex. This has an anti-inflammatory action. This is what causes the inflammation to stay in the localized area of tissue damage. For an infectious disease to be spread from person to person, we know that there has to be specific conditions. We know that infection occurs through a cyclical or a cycle that links, that are like links in a chain. So the best way to prevent or control infection is interrupting the chain of infection. The way of transport of a pathogenic agent within the environment or from person to person is either going to be direct or indirect contact. So direct contact would obviously be um, coughing, sneezing, touching. Indirect contact would be putting your hand on a surface that has um, the virus or the bacteria on it. There are also what's called vectors. These are carriers of pathogenic agents. These can be mosquitoes, fleas, ticks, or flies. There are three very important aspects in the chain of infection. These are the interaction between the agent, the host, and the mode of transmission. 
A reservoir is the place where the pathogen is routinely found. This reservoir can be living, such as people, animals, insects, or it can be innate or non-living. It can be found in soil or in water or on surfaces. So to prevent infection, the number one way is obviously going to be hand hygiene. Right? We perform this with soap and water if the hands are visibly soiled, or we can use an alcohol-based sanitizing solution for routine um, practices during patients. The, the alcohol-based solution needs to be at least 60% alcohol for it to be effective. We wash our hands irregardless of whether or not gloves were used or not used. We are to remove rings or other types of jewelry. We are not to have false nails or have overlays. These all harbor microorganisms or bacteria. As nurses, we understand that our hand hygiene needs to be performed with an approved soap and it needs to be under warm running water. We use friction for at least 15 to 30 seconds. And we want to make sure that areas between our fingers and our tops of our, the top of our hands, as well as the palm side of our hands, are actually thoroughly rubbed. Okay, this friction helps get rid of any loose type cells on our hands. Standard precautions, these are designed to prevent any transmission of any type of pathogen or microorganism from one patient to another. They, these precautions are also vital because it helps in, protect the nurses and other healthcare staff so that way they're not exposed to an infection. So personal protective equipment or PPE as it's called, this can is used to protect an individual that provides care from exposure. When we wear gloves, we want to make sure that they are a protective that they are a protective barrier. They are not to protect the patient. They are protect they are to protect us from transferring anything from this patient to the next. If our gloves are dirty, we want to make sure that we immediately take our gloves off, wash our hands, and then put on new gloves as per the institutions policy, procedures, and protocol. So transmission-based precautions. These actually go a step further than our standard precautions. And when you're looking at contact precautions, this would be any way of using the sense of touch to transfer any of the microorganisms. Droplet precautions are something like um, a sneeze or large particles. They routinely will fall sick, I'm sorry, three feet from the individual. Airborne precautions, these are very small particles. These need a HEPA filter or an N95 mask because these just float around in the air. So as nurses, we know that we need to understand different types of precautions, standard, right, transmission-based precautions. We need to make sure that we understand these. So I've incorporated this small video on infectious disease precautions. It's a YouTube video for you to watch. Be mindful that when you have PPE on, you cannot reach inside of your pockets of your scrubs or your um, uniform because you have gloves on and PPE and you don't want any of this to get on your own clothing. So as a nurse, we need to think ahead and make sure that everything we're going to need is out and ready before we ever go into the patient's room. Patients that have had a stem cell transplant or anything else that would necessarily um, suppress the immune system, so if they've had chemo or radiation, these require their own form of isolation precautions. You can think of the isolation they need as reverse isolation. So what this is, is we are wearing PPE to protect the patient from us because we know that these people, they are immunocompromised, meaning they don't have enough white blood cells on board. Their immune system isn't um, up to par 
the way a healthy individuals would be. So they need to be in a protective environment away from other individuals. And when we go in, that is why we wear PPE is to protect the immunocompromised patient from us, the healthcare workers. So two methods of actually preventing droplets from spreading to others is when we as nurses teach people to cover their mouth whenever they sneeze or cough, as well as turning their head away from someone whenever they're coughing and they don't cough in someone's face. Oftentimes people will maybe use a tissue or Kleenex and we need to encourage them to throw those away when they're finished. But we also want to make sure that we teach them that every time this happens, they also need to wash their hands to ensure that they don't have any microbes left on their hands and they're not going to spread it to other individuals. The Joint Commission, these are the, this is the agency that accredited hospitals. They announced that any observation by any of their surveyors of any individual that failure fails to do hand hygiene during direct patient care, then the institution will be cited because this will be, they will be considered deficient. And this action took place in January of 2008. So hand washing is something that is definitely required in a hospital or any type of medical environment. When we think of healthcare associated infections or HAIs, one of them is the urinary tract, and we want to make sure that we only use a catheter when it's necessary. And when we are instilling a catheter, we're definitely using sterile technique. We want to make sure that the drainage system for the catheter is closed off the floor and below the bladder level. This will prevent urine from backflowing or refluxing into the bladder. We also want to make sure that we empty the drain bag into a container without contaminating the spout of the bag. And then when we close the spout, we need to make sure that we wipe it with an alcohol prep pad before we actually secure it. So we're going to make sure that we remove indwelling catheters as soon as we can. This will help decrease our patient's risk of infection. For surgical wounds, this is another HAI. Um, surgical patients, they will be administered what's called prophylactic antimic antimicrobials. What this means is before surgery, they're going to get a dose of a medication. We also wanna make sure that as nurses, we change um, any dirty dressings or linens right away and dispose of them appropriately. We also need to make sure that our patients have good nutrition and adequate fluid intake. When we think of our respiratory tracts, we wanna make sure that we will encourage our patient to cough, deep breathe, use their incentive spirometer and move around. If our patient has a trach, we're gonna perform suctioning and trach care underneath aseptic technique or surg surgical sterile technique and we want to make sure that we protect this patient from others that have colds or signs of infection. When we think of bloodstream or bacteremia infections, when we're dealing with anything that has to do with the patient's bloodstream, we want to ensure that we're using aseptic technique whenever we administer any intravenous or IV fluids. Whenever we're accessing any IV ports, we're going to make sure that we follow the guidelines whenever we insert an IV, including the dressing, the tubing, as well as catheters that are used. As a nurse, we know that we each time we go in and assess our patient, we need to look at their site, their IV site. We're looking for increase in redness, which is erythema, pain, or potentially infiltration of the fluid. If we notice anything, we will need to notify the healthcare provider right away and let them know. So for, for multi-drug resistant organisms, the reason these came about is from the overuse of antibiotics. So we know as nurses that viruses 
they are not phased with the use of antibiotics. Antibiotics are for bacteria. So because back in the 70s and 80s, antibiotics were overused, now we have what we call these superbugs or multi-drug resistant microorganisms. Um, like MR, MRSA, which is a staph infection, so it's methicillin resistant, or um, VRSA, which is vancomycin resistant. Those are two examples of multi-drug resistant organisms. So when we're talking um, about HIAs related to cost. So for example, the cost of treating a catheter related bloodstream infection in a patient that's in intensive care can average around $56,000 and can extend their hospital stay by as great as three weeks or 21 days. We know that central line associated bloodstream, so if you have a port that goes into a main vein, these are very costly. The second most costly is ven ventilator associated pneumonias, as well as surgical site infections. Hospitals are not, are not reimbursed for the cost of caring for these types of infections. So for hand hygiene, according to the National Patient Safety Goals, compliance with the hand hygiene is the primary way to reduce the HIAs in the institution. We need to make sure that as nurses, we perform our hand hygiene in front or in the view of our patient and the family. This will help increase their confidence in us and it will help promote our nurse-patient relationship. So for C. diff or C. albicans infections, these we can only use soap and water to clean our hands. Alcohol and alcohol-based sanitizers, this only makes the spores for these types of organisms sticky, so they just want to clump together. It doesn't kill them. So we need to make sure that we're doing hand hygiene before or after any direct patient care or before or after we do any type of invasive or sterile procedure or we may come in contact before, um, before coming, after coming in contact with any infectious materials. Nursing interventions for us to help prevent these um, are our hand hygiene. We have standardized kits for dressing changes, and we use chlorhexidine-based antiseptic for skin preparations. So we need to make sure as nurses that we understand these and we follow the institution's procedures and protocols to help reduce healthcare-acquired infections. So infection surveillance for us requires that we as nurses are on the alert. We look for signs and symptoms of infection in our patients. And we also make sure that we look at our lab results to see if there's an increase in the white blood cell count. These would both indicate to us that our patient may have an infection or an infection is starting. And if we happen to notice any of these signs or symptoms that are listed, we want to make sure that we notify the healthcare provider right away. So we have a certain patient population that is more susceptible to getting these types of infections or just infections in general. So people that have any underlying health problems or issues, any injuries or illnesses, if patients have any drainage tubes in or catheters, any type of IVs, if patients are extremely young or extremely old, we know that their, their immune system is not as functioning as it should be. If our patients are immunocompromised, so they may um, ha have an organ transplant, may have had a stem cell transplant, they may um, be a, ca a cancer patient that has had chemo or radiation. These are all patients that we know as nurses are more likely to get an infection. Medical asepsis you will see used in a physician's office or on a regular nursing floor. Medical asepsis, the whole goal is to 
reduce the amount of microorganisms that are moving about and that can cause an infection for our patient. This type of asepsis is using hand hygiene, wearing gloves when appropriate, you know, keeping patients separated so that we have, um, we don't have patients that are extremely sick with patients that are more healthy. For surgical asepsis, this is a sterilization technique. Okay, we wanna eliminate all of the pathogens, all of the microorganisms. So for any type of surgical actual procedure, this requires that the first line of defense or the skin is compromised. Surgical septus is also used when we put in an IV catheter into a vein, so like a port. When we put in a Foley, when we put in internal monitoring devices. Hand hygiene for surgical asepsis is more vigorous and there's specific policies that needs to be followed. In a surgically aseptic environment, individuals must wear surgical gowns, face masks, and sterile gloves whenever they're working with the patient and performing patient care. They must be put on in a specific fashion and then removed in a specific way. So when we're talking about sepsis, this is a very common associated with a bacterial invasion from gram-negative bacteria like Pseudomonas or um, E. coli or Klebsiella pneumoniae or gram-positive bacteria. The toxins that these form are secreted into the blood from the pathogens. This reacts with our blood vessels and cell membranes. This stimulates a massive inflammatory and immune response. The capillary permeability is increased and this results in fluid loss from the vascular space. It causes cellular, inju cellular injury and it causes greatly increased cellular metabolic rates if the sepsis is not aggressively treated. So when we're doing our data collection and we're considering different types of data, we make sure that we get subjective data as well as objective data. So subjective data for us is anything that the patient tells us. It is related to pain, headache, um, chills, bladder symptoms, insect bites, comprom um, compromised immune system. Objective data is any information that we gather ourselves. So if we look at lab values, if we take vital signs, listen to their lungs, we look at their skin and we see lesions or rashes, we see cloudiness in their urine, any abnormal odors. Okay, if we notice a localized infection and we see the edema, erythema, and that there's tenderness upon palpation of that site, there's going to be heat that we may feel, or there may be a loss of function for that body part. Older adults, especially those older than 80, they have a very um, low baseline body temperature. Because they have a de decreased inflammatory and immune response, their temperature may only need to rise a very slight amount in the presence of an infection. So for them, any small increase in temperature could be extremely significant. Signs of inflammation may or may not be present, or they may be milder than what we would see in a younger individual. One sign for us is we note that they can have a decrease in their mental alertness. They may have increased fatigue or a sudden onset of confusion, irritability, or apathy. And this could be a clue to us as nurses that an infection is present. So when we're planning and talking about infection control, we need to make sure that we help to maintain the integrity of the skin and the mucous membranes so that they can remain as good effective barriers for our patients. We also know that 
some patients, because of um, the expanded precautions or the isolation precautions that they may have to have, this can make them feel dirty or they can feel isolation. Subjective complaints that may indicate to us of an infection would be fatigue, a loss of appetite, a headache, nausea, general malaise, and pain. Remember that subjective is information that the patient tells you. Objective signs or objective data that as nurses we may note is a, um, a fever, tachycardia or tachypnea. We are also assessing all the vital signs. We're listening to the lungs, auscultating lungs to listen for abnormal breath sounds. We're looking at skin for lesion, lesions and rashes. We're looking at the urine for any cloudiness, any discoloration, um, any odors. We want to make sure that the bowel sounds are auscultated, auscultated in all four quadrants. And we want to gently palpate or press on the abdomen and ask the patient if they have any tenderness or pain when we do this. So besides doing all of these tasks for objective data, we want to make sure that we're also looking for local infection signs. Remember, it's erythema, edema, um, swelling, pain at the site, upon palpation or movement, there may be heat noted in the area, and they possibly could lose the functioning of the affected body part. So things that we're gonna do if our patient has an infection. We know that they need plenty of rest, so we're gonna make sure that their environment is conducive to resting. If they have a fever or muscle aches, there are, we could ask the physician for a prescription for medication. We can also use um, sponge baths. We can use warm compresses that will promote healing. And we know that exercise promotes um, circulation of the bloodstream and that allows more of the protein necessary to promote healing to go throughout the body. Sometimes we may need to give our patients an antimicrobial agent we always want to make sure that we're using medical asepsis, which is clean technique, and we're watching our lab values. So we want to note if there's any um, indication of an increase in the white blood cell count. So a white blood cell count should be between 5,000 to 10,000 millimeters cubed. So we can perform tests to help us determine what kind of agent we're looking for or we're looking at. So if you do a culture or culture and sensitivity, that will help determine the organism. We can also do different tests. Blood tests, we can look for antigens and antibodies. We can also do um, x-rays, we can do CT scans, or we can do MRIs. These are all assist us or the physician and finding changes within the body. And we can also locate an abscess that could be potential site of infection. So we always wanna make sure as nurses that we actually teach our patients. Education is in our scope of practice and it is our job. So we wanna make sure that we give them all the information that they need. If they're having a test, we need to explain to them what the test is, how it's going to function, and what the test will determine. If there's a treatment, why are they getting this treatment? What can they expect when they go to get this treatment? What can they expect post-treatment? Okay, is there any special precautions? Are they not allowed to eat or drink after midnight? Do they maybe have to drink um, barium, um, a bar do a barium swallow for some type of a study? So during an infection, we're always going to have an evaluation after we implement different steps to help our patient decrease their infection or reach their goal. So we wanna make sure that their vital signs are within their normal range, okay? Everybody's different, so it has to be individualized and that's why we need to know their range. 
We're watching the white blood cell count as well as the erythrocyte sedimentation rates. We want to make sure that those are within standard ranges. We want our patient to be able to just relax comfortably, right? They shouldn't have any increase in pain and they should have their nutritional as well as their fluid needs met. As a greater number of nurses work within the community in the community settings, there are various opportunities to educate the public and the community about preventing the spread of infection. And it is very important that people know how to decrease the transmission of infection. So we're always teaching about things, um, how, you know, how do you wash your hands appropriately? You know, because most people don't do the 15 to 20 second hand hygiene that's necessary. We also educate the people about getting specific immunizations, especially depending on their age. So we know as people age, they have um, vaccinations or immunizations that they should be getting, whether it's for shingles, whether it's for pneumonia. A nurse that works out of the home needs to teach techniques of medical asepsis to the patient and the family members. This will help to decrease the risk of cross-contamination from one person to another or to spread the infection within the patient. We will definitely stress hand hygiene and we teach family members not to share any personal items, anything that especially can be contaminated by blood. So a toothbrush or razor, um, females or individuals should not share makeup, especially that that goes around the eye because that can be a portal of entry. Surfaces that may be contaminated with blood, urine, feces, or vomitus, these should be sanitized using soap and water, and then they should be recleaned with a one part to 10 part solution of chlorine bleach and hot water to thoroughly disinfect the area. Cross-infection among members of the household can be prevented by which behaviors? Select all that apply. Sharing personal items, practicing hand hygiene, using bleach to clean surfaces, sealing used dressings in impermeable, impermeable bags, washing soiled linens weekly. The answer is two, three, and four. Many older adults will have low-grade infections of the urinary, respiratory, or gastrointestinal tract, and these can easily be passed on to others if good hand hygiene practices are not practiced. So we need to ensure that anyone that lives in long-term care, they're able to wash their hands before meals, after toileting, um, before and after they've been in a room that's used by the community, think about a dining hall or the activities room, and any time their hands have actually become soiled. We want to make sure that we also clean incontinent patients promptly to help maintain their skin integrity.